After sailing more than a dozen performance multi-holes, we are changing our minds on some critical issues like dagger boards and helm position and even whether we want a performance boat at all. Yep, we've gone a little crazy. Mr. O'Kelly? Yeah, that's me. I'm ready for you. Yeah. I'm Nick. Nice to meet you. Thanks for seeing me, Doctor. My pleasure. What brings you in today? Oh, I've just... I've got a lot of anxiety. About what? I guess performance anxiety. At your job? No. I'm looking for a performance boat. What's a performance boat? Oh. All right. Let me... Let me take it from the top. We had a great production catamaran. She really took care of us for many, many years. In rough seas, in beautiful winds. It just seemed like she was a little too slow. We felt the need for more speed. Isn't sailing designed to be slow? No, 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 you're, you're missing the point. I, I don't wanna go like walking pace. I wanna go like, I don't know, a fast jog or, or maybe even a, a decent run. Have you taken any steps towards this goal? The fire was really lit with this Balance 526 called Galileo. It was beautiful, sleek, and much quicker than Clarity. All right, the helm's a little heavier than Clarity, so it's balanced pretty well. And from there, the fuse was lit. lot of fast boats. It's all about boat speed, baby. And you know what? You can go too fast. And there's a lot of sacrifices. And these boats are a lot more expensive. I can see why you're under a lot of stress here. Is it a money thing? It is. Now, prices on catamarans have come down, but not across the board. I'll try and explain it. People tend to oversimplify, and there's definitely more than one category of catamaran. It's not just performance versus heavy production boats. There's really an in-between gray area with semi-custom boats, quasi-performance boats, performance cruisers, if you will. Before I show you the brands, I just want you to know that I had to draw the lines somewhere. I know, Sea Wind has got a performance boat and it's called the Sea Wind 1600. And maybe the HHOC belongs in the performance category. Across the bottom, of course, you've got the heavier production boats. Leopard, Lagoon, Fontaine Pajot, Bali, they make a lot of boats. Sea Wind, Voyage, Light Wave, the HHOC. Don't see any dagger boards here, but they are somewhat lighter boats and maybe somewhat better performing. I think to call a boat performance, it has to have dagger boards. Katana, Balance, Kinetic. Kinetic you could substitute with a couple other brands as well. Then we'll get up into what I'll call the boutique 
higher performance boats. Oh yes, and Balance has some full carbon builds. They belong in the top tiers as well. At the top of the pyramid, you've got the super light boats, the racers or racer cruisers, the ORC, the gunboats, full carbon builds, and these things just fly. The bottom line is, the further you go up in the pyramid, the skinnier the holes and the bigger the rig, and that makes those boats easier to tip over. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, it's usually one of these fast, light boats. This is a Chris White Atlantic 57. Now that we've got some definitions and a lay of the land, let's take a look at what's been going on in the market. It used to be most first-time catamaran owners started with something a little heavier and a little bit more spacious. Then, sometime later, if they like the cruising lifestyle and they want a faster boat, then they buy something a bit quicker. But in the last couple of years, we've seen a new trend. And that's first-time catamaran owners or even first-time boat owners buying much higher performing boats. At Utremer Week, we met a lot of future owners that fell into that later category. You follow the, the traffic on Starboard, and this guy... It's really good to see these folks getting some much needed training. But I did wonder if these future owners really understood how powerful these boats are. Now, why is there a bigger risk going to a faster boat right away? I don't understand. Getting used to the cruising lifestyle, it, it's an adjustment process. It takes time. Some people are pretty good with it within a few months. Some take a year or more to really get into the groove. Now, if you put yourself in a really steep learning curve to get to know a boat over a short period of time, especially if it's a more challenging boat to understand, well, it's just a lot more stress on the situation. Most demonstration sales for a potential buyer look something like this. Perfect winds in a protected bay, flat seas. Man, it just doesn't get any more glorious than this. But the open ocean doesn't look like this. Sometimes, not all the time, it looks like this. And on a lighter boat, constructed to go fast, it sounds like this. Again, not all the time, but sometimes. And these boats have a lot of expensive gear that you need to know how to use, even when the wind is really piping up. And if you don't handle things right, can be expensive and dangerous. So you have some anxiety about other people getting themselves in trouble. I, I do. I mean, everybody's got to fend for themselves. I mean, you got to take ultimate responsibility for, for your own course of action here. But yeah, I'm concerned that even if they don't get into trouble, they're not going to enjoy it as much as they could if they had taken a little bit slower pace in this entire endeavor and got to know catamaran sailing and performance sailing over months or years. Thank you, Seed, for sponsoring this week's video. Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic is a whole body experience as it supports heart health, ease of bloating, and smooth, clear skin. Their DSO-1 is a broad spectrum probiotic and prebiotic formulated with 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains. I've been taking seed for the past couple of months, and my favorite part is I can take it on an empty stomach first thing in the morning. It works great with my intermittent fasting schedule. Seed is offering you 25% off on the DSO-1. Just click on the link below in the description and enter O'Kelly25. Thanks again, Seed, for sponsoring this video. Hiring a professional, somebody who really knows their stuff, to help you along the way can really cut the learning curve down. Easy and as we go into it. 
A lot of cruisers find that pulling on the strings is actually the easy part, but there's a lot more to open ocean sailing. You got to be a master meteorologist, a weather router. You got to be able to make your own water and fix the water maker when it won't make water. You got to take the funny diagrams that you see and translate it into real life. You've got to be your own electrician, your own diesel mechanic, your own rigger. And you got to be able to make food in a sink when nothing will stay on the countertops because it's too rough. Like an aerobics workout. <laughs> are, you, are you getting some leg workout? Yeah. <laughs> This is all a lot to learn. And I think that learning it on a speedy boat could actually slow the learning process. I want to use an analogy from aviation. If you've played some video games and you're pretty sharp, you could probably land a CRJ 700 in a simulator. 20, right here. 10. Oh, hold it, let it settle down. This is gonna hurt. But you probably wouldn't know what to do in an emergency. What did I do? Uh, I just, I just. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Beechcraft Bonanza. At one point, it got the nickname Doctor Killer. It got that nickname because it's a high-performance plane that. Doctors, at least back in the day, could afford. But just because you can afford it doesn't mean that you're safe to operate it. Here we are making a steep approach to clear some very tall trees and landing on a very short runway. But I'm only safe to do that because I'm instrument rated, I've got hundreds of hours in airplanes, and I'm doing my recurrency training. So I got somebody next to me watching my every move and pointing things out when I'm not doing it perfectly. And I'm flying this plane because the owner bought it without a pilot's license. He found it was just too hard to learn in. He ended up getting his license flying a small Cessna, like we all did. So getting back to the topic at hand, a lot of high performance boats are bought on beautiful days. But the ocean isn't always so calm and beautiful. And when things go wrong, they go wrong at night. And in a hurry. Hey, what up? What up, Nick? Oh, we lost the spinnaker. Somebody woke me from my deep sleep. After the huge surge in demand for catamarans, mostly in the entry-level market, a lot of those folks have said, you know what, we've had our fun. It's time to head home and get back to real life, and prices have corrected. Meanwhile, the smaller producers of the more performance-oriented boats are slowly fulfilling their order books. Hopefully those first-time owners get good training and have a great time. But if they don't, a lot of these boats could come back on the market in the next few years. I think the recipe is there for a bit of a bubble. I'm nervous that if that bubble pops, prices for the high performance cats are gonna come way down. Can a couple handle a performance boat or do they need crew? Well, you know, it's really the crew that makes a boat fast or slow and it's the crew that makes it safe or unsafe. And you just can't say whether or not any of these boats are safe or unsafe with just a couple aboard. It really depends on their knowledge and their experience and their familiarity with the boat. You just can't make blanket statements. For one inexperienced couple, it would be downright dangerous to head across an ocean. For a seasoned crew of one or two, uh, they may be able to handle those same conditions without any problem at all. So really, we're talking about a performance couple versus a performance sailboat. That's a really good point. Does the crew match the boat?
Are these really faster boats? Uh, the last couple of performance catamarans I was on were much, much faster than our heavier cruising catamaran. 16.5 These performance boats are a blast to sail. When conditions are right, especially when the seas are low, they just absolutely fly. Here we are doing close to 23 knots at times, with no problem averaging about 14 to 15 knots in 33 knots of breeze. However, in the open ocean, 33 knots of breeze equals three to four meter seas. So you tend to reef down and slow the boat up as much as you can. If the seas allow, it's really the close reach where these boats really perform well. 10, 12 knots, no problem in 16 or 17 knots of breeze. On a broad reach, it's pretty easy to do a little less than half the wind speed. Not bad. If there was one big disappointment that I felt, it was when going further off the wind. Our quote-unquote heavy cruiser, our Leopard 46, really wouldn't be much slower here. And here's a big takeaway. Sailboats need wind to sail. And when the winds went light, even light boats don't sail. Our full crossing of the Atlantic on the Outremer 55 moonshot took 16 and a half days from the Canaries to the BVI. And we spent a full three and a half days of that motoring. That's certainly no fault of the boats, but it's interesting to point out that even light boats have to motor when there's no wind. So much motoring, in fact, for us that we had to divert to Antigua to take on more fuel. Because we were expecting to be faster than this. Yeah, right? <laughs> Our crossing time certainly wasn't bad. It was decent. But it did make me question just how important having a performance boat is to passage times. Now, I could recreate the data, but I'm not going to. There's a fantastic video already on the internet that you should watch if you're interested in this sort of thing. The channel's called Bell and Beast, and this gentleman compared all the passage times for the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers, the ARC, for a couple of years. And his conclusion is that performance boats are certainly faster on passage, but not by as much as you might think. It's actually waterline that makes the biggest difference in passage time. So it might make more sense to spend your money on a longer boat than a lighter boat, at least as far as open ocean passages are concerned. Check out the video. I'll put a link in the description below. All this experience on performance boats has really changed our minds about helm position. At least for the kind of passage making we want to do, having an exposed helm just isn't all that important. Yeah, so I think it's all about the protection. You know, you can have one of these. You can have, if it's colder, you can have really good foul weather gear. Well, it's really nice to be able to see the sails from the helm. Really, on passage, you're not spending much time at the wheel at all. For us, it's a lot more important to have a protected spot where we can navigate from and at least get an eye on the sails fairly easily. Blasting up wind into 42 knots is not something you're going to do on passage unless you absolutely have to. So at this point, I'd put a lot more emphasis in having a comfortable office chair that I can sit inside with than having a really comfortable helm position outside. The forward cockpit is our clear first choice. But those found on the gunboats and the Chris Whites are just too exposed. But the enclosed forward cockpit on the Windelow 50, it's very intriguing. We would love to sail this one offshore. 
I can't believe I'm going to say this, but another topic we might be flip-flopping on is the necessity of dagger boards. Yes, by my own definition, I might not be looking for a performance boat anymore. Don't get me wrong, having dagger boards would be fantastic, but they're going to be most useful in lighter wind conditions and in inshore and protected waters. But for offshore passage making, nobody, and I mean nobody, wants to sail upwind. That was the case on our monohulls, our heavier cat, and that's been our experience on the lighter boats too. Going upwind just absolutely sucks. So everybody plans to try and sail with wind after the beam. That's the way we sailed most of the time on Clarity, and that's probably the way we'll sail on our next boat. So why spend so much more money trying to find a boat that's got dagger boards? That's a question we haven't quite answered for ourselves yet, but if the right boat came along that didn't have dagger boards, I think we'd go for it. So, all of this performance catamaran sailing may have taught us that we don't need a performance boat. You've looked at a lot of boats. Have you ever considered that maybe you are the problem? Definitely the problem. Definitely the problem. Thanks for pointing that out, Doctor. I'm definitely the problem. We're the problem. Maybe our expectations have just been way out of line. Maybe we need to spread our wings a little bit further. Doctor, talking with you has been really helpful to me. What do you suggest to alleviate my performance anxiety? It's really simple. You need to find an activity that makes you feel relaxed. Ah, oh, that would be sailing. It's just one problem. I, I, oh, I we're out of time. A... Sorry. It was great to meet you. Let's schedule some more time. Thanks, Doctor. Time for fireside chats. How's my Brad Pitt look going? It's coming along. What I'm almost think, my Brad Pitt. <laughs> you might need some extensions down here because <laughs> that's going to take another year. Some blonde highlights, yeah, and blue eye contacts. <laughs> then I'll be I'll be forty percent to Brad Pitt look. <laughs> well, um, this discussion of performance boats versus non-performance boats, it's so easy to get into the mindset of this is the right way, or this is my opinion, and hey, you do you. <laughs> that's, that's what you should do, you should do you. I do think that for us personally, we've fallen into a little bit of a, a trap. We got, we got plugged back into the matrix <laughs> in terms of this whole performance boats are better than heavy production boats. And I, I just based on my own experience, I don't think that's true mm -hmm. because looking back on our experiences and our adventures, I, I, my memories are not framed with helm positions and having this particular sail available to me or, or this particular passage time. Mm -hmm. My memories, I don't know about you, mm -hmm. not, not characterized by those sorts of things. Yeah, it's about being on the water, feeling the wind, looking at the stars and all the sea creatures and meeting cool people. Yeah, cool people and cool experiences that really just have nothing to do with the weight of the boat mm -hmm. or the size of the mainsail or, or all those things. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that going fast isn't fun. It's just that it's a major trade-off mm -hmm. that that uh, that has ramifications on comfort, and that comfort isn't just physical, but it's it's mental comfort. How secure do you feel out there? Yeah. And those are questions that you have to answer for yourself. Um, for us, we've got a lot of miles. <laughs> we've got a lot of experience on a lot of different boats. And would I say at this point that we must have a performance boat? I would say definitely not. Something that I learned was that the ability to go fast is a lot of work. It really is. Because when you go fast, not only is a lot of pressure on the rig and the sails and the crew, you got to be able to slow down quick too. Yeah, absolutely. 
So this little adventure we've had over the last uh, bit of time without a boat, um, it's incredible that you guys have stuck with us. For us, the adventure never really stopped. It's in, true. In fact, we've seen some incredible things without having a boat. Mm -hmm. So it's not like our lives have, have stopped because we don't have a helm in our hands. <laughs> We've had a lot of fun. It's true. We've met so many of you out there, and we've seen so many places in the world that we wouldn't have been able to see. I'd say also, if, if you'll let me be a, a little bit woo-woo for a second, there's been, a, there's been an inner journey, too. It definitely has. I don't know if you guys have witnessed any of that, but we are definitely more patient and we're more resilient within that. It's sometimes hard to show on, on camera. Yeah. It's boring to watch people be patient. <laughs> it's not very exciting, is it? <laughs> Speaking of that, thanks you guys for sticking with us all this time. And um, as we always do, we just want to send out an extra huge thank you to our patrons. Yes. We Without could, you... We couldn't do it. No, we wouldn't yeah. be doing this. So thank you. And we should have an update here in the not too distant future about hmm, a potential new boat for us. Yep. If it's meant to be, it will be. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.